What is up, everybody? Welcome back to DVD's Nuts and Hot... I was, was going to say Hopcorn. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to DVD's Nuts and Popcorn. I am your host, the Physical Media Mac, the PWM. Guess what? Buck 25 Bush has another movie drop, guys. So we're going to hit up about eight Dollar Trees. And we're going to find out what's new. And then also in this video, we're going to talk about Donnie Darko and the controversial sequel, S. Darko. And on top of that, we're going to discuss a gay film starring Al Pacino. All right, guys, let the physical media, physical media adventure begin.
All right, guys, welcome to the recap portion of the video. We're gonna jump right into this after I have me a little sippy sip. So refreshing. All right, let's jump right into the gayness. So we have Cruising. This is a 1980 crime thriller uh, film, a slasher film, written and directed by William Friedkin, of all people, and starring Al Pacino, Paul Sorvino, and Karen Allen. It's loosely based on the novel of the same name by the New York Times reporter Gerald Walker about a serial killer targeting gay men, particularly those men associated with the uh, gay club scene in the late 1970s. This is the gayest film I've ever seen in my life. Without a doubt. From the opening credits to the end credits, it's nothing but gayness. And listen, the PWM is a friend of the gays, so uh, don't anyone get offended by what I have to say here. But yeah, this is... Uh, this is a really gay film, man. The whole film is just gay. Like, it's literally gay clubs with men wearing leather, kissing each other, frolicking around. It's gay as shit. Now, this is, I would say this is probably the Brokeback Mountain of slasher films. And uh, I've never seen Brokeback Mountain, but I guarantee you it's not gay. It's not gayer than this film. I guarantee it. Um,. So anyway, a young police officer played by, I can't, I can't even hold it together. A young police officer played by Al Pacino, I think he might even be a rookie cop, is sent in to infiltrate the gay nightclub scene to help track down a serial killer. There is tons of gay stuff going on in this movie, and it's a who, it's a who done it. so you don't know who the fuck the killer is. And there's all these close-up scenes where guys are checking each other out and staring into each other's eyes. But you don't know if if one of the guys is the killer just looking for his next prey or if they're just being gay. It's very unsettling. I'm not even trying to be funny here. Um, it's it's disturbing. The gayness is disturbing. Al, you actually start to feel bad for Al Pacino's character because presumably he's gay and he's going undercover and he's put through all this gayness and it's like, you can't help but feel bad for him being subject to so much gayness. Uh, now, there's a guy, one a person that I used to know once told me, because I wouldn't know, I don't, uh, homie don't play that, but he said that if you commit a gay act, as long as you say no homo, Within 30 seconds of that gay act, it cancels out the gay act. So it's like it never happened. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I couldn't help but think about it when I was watching this movie, if Al Pacino knew about the gay rule. But um, yeah, man, Al Pacino cruising. And again, a film by William Friedkin. William Fried Friedkin, in my opinion, is a genius. Uh, he was the director of The French Connection, most notably the director of The Exorcist, probably the scariest horror movie of all time, To Live and Die in L.A. Uh, later on, he did Killer Joe, Bug. Uh, I think he did a movie called The Hunted. He's a, a legendary director. He's a cocky son of a bitch too, man, but I like him, man. I, I hope he's still alive. I didn't look it up before. I can't remember if he's still alive. I think he is. And I like watching YouTube videos of him just talking about movies and stuff, man. He, he's a... Uh, He's uh, one of my favorite directors for sure. And, um, but anyway, so this, this is an interesting film. So at first, because I'm dumb, right? There, I, I knew there was protest, there was protesting around this movie where they were literally protesting so bad during this movie that there's lots of scenes they had to re- Dub. They had to dub voices in that, that the protesters actually ruined the scenes and on purpose. They had like megaphones and shit, so they screwed up dialogue and they had to dub a lot of stuff in. And at first I thought, oh, because it's a gay film, 
straight people are protesting this film. No, it's the, it's the opposite. Gay people were protesting this film because gay people were being exploited in this movie. You know, gay people in, I think it's in New York, in these gay club scenes were being exploited. Like it's not a seedy, in reality, it's really not like a seedy um, <laughs> gay place. I don't know. I don't know how they could be mad about it. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. But anyway, it's funny because William, or not funny, but William Friedkin was friends with some guy in the mafia. You know, mafia likes to rub shoulders with sports figures and directors and movie stars. So it does make sense because William Friedkin, this was post uh, Exorcist. And um, so he liked William Friedkin and he owned two of the biggest gay clubs in New York. So William Friedkin asked him, hey, could I go in and shoot films in your clubs? And, uh, you know, live uh, 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 film, you know, live filming where it'd be actual gay people in there doing their thing and stuff. And that's why the movie's so gay. It's like, there's people like with fucking wearing jock strings and kissing and groping each other. It's like, he's catching all this stuff like in real time. And, um, no homo, by the way. And, um, so, uh, so very, very realistic, man, without a doubt. Like if one thing about William Friedkin, he brings the real to his films. He does not mess around. And, um, uh, what else did I want to say about this? Um, the killer from The Maniac is in this. Joe Spinell. I love him in movies. He plays this, like, really dirtball, slimy cop that uh, frequencies gay clubs and bars and stuff and takes advantage of the gay guys because he's a police officer. So you know where I'm going with that. And, um, yeah, man, this is an Arrow release. And I, guys, let me tell you something, man. There's a scene in this movie where Al, it, it's so like, I don't even know how to explain it. Like there's a lot of people that say that and, and William Friedkin has an issue with, uh, he's been, he's drug Al Pacino through the mud in interviews. He does not like Al Pacino. So I don't know. I, maybe it has something to do with this movie. A lot of people say that Al Pacino mailed in his role. This was three years before Scarface, believe it or not. And um, it's a very awkward role by him. Very unorthodox uh, performance, I would say. Not even an, well, yeah, I guess unorthodox. But, you know, I don't know if he's like a deer in the headlights. The way he looks in the movie is so funny. But there's this scene, but, but anyway, like people say he mailed it in and other people say it was an amazing performance and I could see it both ways because, you know, when you think, wow, he, he really looks like he's uncomfortable and he looks like he doesn't belong in this fucking movie. Well, if you really look at it, like he's a rookie cop, his, uh, the police chief basically makes him go undercover in the gay world in the gay culture. And, uh, so he's thrown into this world he probably has nothing, he knows nothing about, and he's undercover. You know, he has to move into a gay apartments. He goes to gay clubs night and day. He's around gays constantly, and he looks uncomfortable, and he probably is fucking uncomfortable, and he's probably supposed to be acting uncomfortable. So, I don't know, it's hard to judge the, his acting performance in this, I'm telling you. But he gets this, this, these looks in his eyes when he's staring at the gay man, it's just so fucking funny. But anyway, there's a dance performance in this movie that is so fucking epic. I think I'm going to put it at the end of this summary. I'm going to show a clip of it. Maybe I'll put my own music in there. Maybe it'll just be without music so it didn't get flagged and, pu and uh, pulled down the video. But uh, this guy, like, grabs his hand. And it's like the first time he's, you know, he's around all this gay stuff that's going on. But he really hasn't, you know, he hasn't blown anybody or done anything. No homo. He hasn't done any gay acts or anything like that but he finally dances with a gay guy and the guy grabs him by the hand this guy has this handkerchief and he's sniffing it so you don't know what the hell if it's some kind of drug or whatever and Al Pacino gets on the dance floor he's da he starts to dance but he looks very uncomfortable and then he grabs the handkerchief and sniffs it so I don't know if it's like ass juice or uh, magical uh, magical gay 
powder. I, I don't know what is going on, but he all of a sudden he starts dancing like he has a broomstick up his ass. He's gyrating around, just frolicking on the dance floor. And he looks like he's nutting in his fucking pants for like 30 seconds straight. It is the most hilarious, epic dancing I've ever seen in my life. Crispin Glover from Friday the 13th Part 4 has nothing on this dance. This is the greatest dance, most epic train wreck of a dance scene in the history of horror movies. William Friedkin, a slasher film with a gay Al Pacino. I think Al Pacino turns gay in this movie. He's, he's going back and seeing his wife or soon-to-be wife during the course of the... Uh, the undercover operations and having sex with her and pretty soon he's having not having sex with her at all and she's wondering why don't you touch me anymore and there's that, that there's that whole uh, side to it but this movie's hilarious man um what else and it's an open-ended ending you don't know who killed anybody and i'm reading explanations of the fucking movie it's so confusing there's apparently multiple killers in the movie. Maybe two, maybe three. Al Pacino could be one of the killers in the movie. You don't know. You have to just figure it out for yourself. It's one of those type of movies. But yeah, man, this is an Arrow release. I bought this off of Amazon Prime. And there you go. I think it's got reverse art. got some kind of promotion for oh wow all kinds of stuff in there i see eating alive is highlighted the uh toby hooper alligator film or slasher slash alligator even eating alive's in there some good stuff in there blood and black lace society oh i thought this opened up this is just a card so yeah, lots of cool films right there. Wake Up and Kill is like the highlight, I guess. And yeah, we have some reversible art. Doesn't look too different though. Oh yeah, it is different. She has the same color scheme. Yeah, Al Pacino's hilarious in this movie. So yeah, there's the, uh, the alternate cover art there all right guys let's check out al pacino's gay dance performance All right, guys, you're probably wondering why the change of clothes. Well, I tried to finish the video yesterday, but there was a bunch of straight rights activists protesting around my car because I was talking about the movie Cruising. It's very weird. Anyway, let's get to the Dollar Tree pickups, and then we'll review or talk about the uh, Darko series and also the Dread movie. Starbucks, uh, the line was so long, I had to get McDonald's coffee. McDonald's coffee is very underrated. Although I will say, their afternoon coffee is typically not as good as their morning coffee. When Starbucks is good, 24 hours a day. So that's the only knock on McDonald's coffee. It's got that burnt taste to it in the afternoon. All right, Dollar Tree pickups. This is one that I've seen in previous drops, but I've never seen it at my Goodwill or they were picked through my Goodwills before I uh, before I went into them back when this was uh, dropping, I guess, um, the beginning of the year or whenever this dropped. 
But anyway, this is a 2016 16 horror comedy directed by Lowell Dean, whom directed both of the uh, Wolf Cop and another Wolf Cop. So that's pretty cool. And I think it has the same, the same main character. I don't know what his name is. The actual Wolf Cop is played by the same guy. And uh, I don't know too much about these movies except for the main protagonist is a you know, blackout drunk and he blacks out. And when he blacks out, he turns into this uh, crime fighting werewolf. You know, I've blacked out many times in my life and uh, I've been in some pretty hairy situations, but nothing like this, pretty crazy. But yeah, man, uh, this is supposed to be really good. Uh, both movies, I think, got good reviews. This is an RLJE release. And it comes with the uh, slippy slip. So not bad at all to finally get this for the old collection. A fun, gory, and hilarious midnight movie. And I like the fact that it says, dirtier, hairier. Classic little tagline right there. All right, next up here. I'm very hesitant to pick up these Pop Flix collections. It seems like it seems like it's becoming a staple of Dollar Tree. It, there's a bunch of these now. There's one that I left behind. It was like a brains collection. But this one actually looks like it's pretty good. This is a slasher collection. And it actually has a Dario Argento movie in here. The Hatchet Murders. So a little hidden gem inside of this uh, inside of this little collection here. It has Don't Look in the Basement, Scream Bloody Murder, Silent Night Bloody Night, not to be confused with Silent Night Deadly Night. And it looks like a lot of these are 70s film and are uh, 70s films. I'm a big fan of 70s movies. And then. Uh, of course, like I mentioned, uh, The Hatchet Murders. And then the last movie is The Severed Arm. So definitely a cool little collection of movies. I don't know if I'm going to collect all the other ones. Actually, you know what? I think I picked up one more I'm going to show you guys. But it's more like movies from the 60s. But yeah, cool collection. Alright, let's get, get into this one. This is probably my... Uh, my pick them right here. This is my pick of the week right here. Uh, my recommend of the week, guys. I think you guys need to check this one out. Go to your uh, neighborhood Buck 25 Bush and pick up Return to Center. Yeah, so just to break down this movie. So this movie stars Rosamund Pike. I think she's British and uh, very, very beautiful woman and a just a real captivating performance man she can act her ass off i love her now i'll be looking out for other movies that she's in i'm a big fan to rosamund pike beautiful but she can act her fucking ass off now her performance in this gets compared to her performance in gone girl which i believe is a david fincher movie and i it's been so long since i've seen gone girl I don't remember it, but supposedly she acts very similar in this movie. It's kind of her her go-to in the bag type of role. Like that's like she's perfect at acting like this menacing psychopath. And uh that's what makes this kind of a unique rape revenge film as well. It's not just girl gets raped, then goes and gets revenge. It's a very black widow-ish type of uh type of uh role that she plays in this movie she's a uh, she's a control freak number one she's ocd she's traumatized from her childhood and uh yeah she's definitely a, a complex character but what happens is her friend sets her up on a blind date and some random guy walks up to her door like i don't know an hour or two before the date is supposed to happen and she confuses him as the date. And he was just knocking at her door to just rape her, basically. And uh, that character is played by Shiloh Fer Fernandez, which, by the way, looks like a young Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, like, 
deadpan, I mean, not deadpan, but uh, a real like striking resemblance to uh, Joaquin F uh, Phoenix. But, uh, and he does a, a good job in this movie as well. But um, she lets him in, mistaking her, mistaking him for the blind date. And he's thinking, wow, this is weird. She's treating me odd. And uh, next thing you know, he hits her, bends her over the kitchen table, rapes her. And uh, real disturbing, although it does cut, it doesn't, it's not like a um, I spit at your grave like graphic scene, but you know, pretty bad for, for, for what it is. And so this guy ends up getting caught right away. He goes to prison and then all of a sudden they show this scene earlier in the movie that's tied to it where her dad's Nick Nolte, which I always like Nick Nolte, he's old gruff Nick Nolte with the beard. And he has this dog. And the dog bites her, jumps on her and bites her. And you're thinking, you're thinking to yourself, why is he biting the daughter? It doesn't really make any sense. So that they don't really give you a backstory on that. But what she starts doing is sending this guy letters in prison. And at the same time, well, saying, you know, hey, I want to see you. I want to visit you. And at the same time, she's like taking over, uh, almost like she's taking care. Like, I think Nick Nolte gets hurt. And maybe the dog had something to do with it. I can't remember now. But she ends up taking care of the dog while Nick Nolte's working. And she's all of a sudden the dog that she hated before. She's loving on it, nourishing the dog, taking care of it so well. And then next thing you know, the dog's dead. So, like, she kills the dog. And then she's doing this Black Widow thing where she's going to visit him, the, the guy who raped her, and treating him nice and dressing in sexy clothes, more sexy clothes every time she comes to visit him. And, it, and they start to build this uh, bond, this close relationship. And, you know, it, the end is predictable because it finally gets where you think it's going to get to. But it's very, like like I said, she, her, her acting performance is really fucking good, man. You can't ha help but just look at her and look at her eyes and her body language and, and think, what the fuck is she doing? Like, what, where is she going with this? Like, it's very unpredictable during the course of the movie, but like I said, at the end, it does get to the rape revenge part, and uh, once it gets there, it's pretty hilarious. Uh, she starts telling him how he has a small dick, and he didn't. She didn't even feel him when uh, when he was inside of her, and uh, it's pretty classic. She has some classic uh, one-liners in that in the uh, the final scene. I don't really love the way the movie ended, but. Uh, I would definitely give this a high recommend. Rosamund Pike is just amazing in it. And uh, yeah, man, really good flick. He picked the wrong person. Or no, he picked the wrong address. And yeah, there's also a backstory about her mother as well, which there's not too many explanation videos on this movie. So I'm not sure if she had something to do with her mother's death, but quite possibly, like her mother didn't take her medicine or something. There's some kind of brief explanation of her mom dying and how she's traumatized by it. Maybe she had something to do with hiding her medicine or what, who knows, man, because at the end of the day, it seems like she is a sociopath and she's a damn, she's damn good at it too. All right, I talked about that way too, too long. Get a sip of the Java here. This is a movie that seems like it's gotten really good reviews, and it's got a little bit of a uh, hype behind it. It's a 2018 release. It says on the front here, Mean Girls Meets The Purge. I can definitely see that, but me, the thing about Mean Girls, Mean Girls had personality. This movie has no personality, or the girls in this movie have no personality, like... You, you don't root for them at all, uh, at least in my opinion. I didn't root for them. I just didn't, they're just non-likable characters. I have the feeling like a lot of younger people are going to love this movie. It's a very, like, self-aware type of film. And, uh, you know, it tries to be shocking, but I've seen so many shocking movies, it, it doesn't shock me. But uh, I'm not going to give a recommend on this one. I, so I'm not going to keep it for the shelf, like I said. But, uh, like I said... A lot of people are probably going to like this one. It just wasn't for me. It has to do with hacking and 
this one girl gets blamed for hacking the mayor, I think it was, and next thing you know, the whole little town they're in is go, uh, going after her and her friends trying to kill them. Not for me. All right, I, Tanya, man. This is a, uh, you know, this is based, you know, this is the real story, or it's based on the real story of Tanya Harden, man, and uh, just a hilarious time. You know, whenever, when other countries make fun of us, I mean, it has to be because of stuff like Tanya Harden. Like, I mean, it's like you just think to yourself, I can understand why other countries look at us with disbelief. You know, it's the Jerry Springer shit that we pull, the, the, the real Jerry Springer shit in Tanya Harding. But you know what? To be honest with you, it was Tanya Harding's boyfriend and her stupid friend that caused all the problems. It wasn't Tanya Harding. You know, I mean, after watching this movie, I know that now. But, um, you know, the media obviously pointed a finger at her. But this is a 2017 release, and it stars Margaret Robbie. And I'm telling you, man, she fucking kills this role. She is so good as Tanya Harden. Beautiful woman. I would love to see her in some other movies. She's a lot bigger than Tanya Harden. I will say that. She's uh, she's thick, too, man. She's uh, she's quite the looker. But anyway, looking at Tanya Harden and some of the, uh, the flashback, actual, like, real footage and stuff, she was a small, like, petite girl. Margaret Robbie is not. She's built like a shit brick house. And uh, gorgeous lady, like I said, uh, her acting performance is just unfucking believable. I know this is a real self-aware, you know, looking at the camera, talking to the camera type of mockumentary. And um, also, McKenna Grace played a young Tanya Harding. I think she fucking blew it out of the water too. She was really good. And uh, yeah, man, this is a really good movie. Really good acting. The, I don't know who played the mother. She was amazing. Uh, the guy who played Jeff Galuli was a good actor. And the friend was a really like a, uh, uh, a comedy highlight in the movie. He's funny as hell in this. I had a lot of, I had a good time in it, man. I laughed a lot during this movie. And um, Tanya Harding was one badass skater, man. She was like the first American or first skater in the world to do like a triple and a half pirouette spin whatever the f you call it and uh yeah super talented but just a redneck i mean tanya harding was the biggest redneck like she worked on cars she was like a total tomboy so it makes it so weird that she was a skater a figure skater and uh she did it she did it her way man she was like uh judges hated her because of her looks and you know the way she presented herself she was like a trailer park fucking uh, trashy American icon figure skater. I like it, man. I, I highly recommend this. I don't know if it's on Blu-ray, but I did notice that some of this stuff I did see on Blu-ray. I don't think I've seen this on Blu-ray, but uh, if Dollar Tree drops it on Blu-ray, I'll probably uh, upgrade this copy right here. One hell of a film. Margaret Robbie is just amazing. All right, I can't pass up on this. This is a different cover than I've seen before. We got Rocky. And by the way, I was talking about, um, what was his name? Joe Spinell that was in Maniac that was in uh, Cruising. And he was actually in Rocky as well. He was a young Joe Spinell. And he was like, uh, when Rocky in the beginning was working for the uh, the street thug guy, that was Joe Spinell. And uh, and by the way, I, I don't think I've mentioned this. Cruising, I don't want you guys to think that I'm saying it's a bad movie. That, you know, it's actually a very well-constructed slasher. I would, I, would, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, of course, if you're a homophobe, you're probably not going to like it, but... Anyway, yeah, Rocky, man. Couldn't pass up on this for a buck twenty-five. Hell yeah. By the way, shout out to Super Duper Gaming World for dropping the beat in this video. All right, next up here we have Glass. I made a mistake picking this one up. I have this on 4K and Blu-ray. 
and uh, this is a 2019, and it's the finale to the Unbreakable Split Trilogy, and uh, probably the worst movie of the three, I would, I would definitely say that. I think I watched this at the movie theater with my family, and um, it's definitely a slow burn. It takes a while to get, to get going. I'm not going to judge it too much, though. I think I really need to uh, do a second viewing on it. But uh, I love Unbreakable, and I think Split is a uh, is a really good flick as well. Split's got one of my favorite female actresses in it. Of course, I won't see her name on here. The blonde chick from Split. She was also in The Witch. Yeah, man glass Mr. Tight White F Mr. Fiberglass alright now next up here we have the remake Amityville Horror and this is produced by our boy Michael Bay I know Michael Bay gets a lot of hate but hey man Michael Bay produced a really good Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie and I think this was around the same time if I remember correctly this is a decent remake it's got Ryan, um, Ryan Reynolds in it, and I thought he did a really good job in this movie. It's directed by Andrew Douglas, and uh, yeah, cool flick, man. This is a uh, variation to the cover, the uh, original cover, so I like that. It says special edition. Of course it's weird how that's tied into the um, conjuring universe now very odd very odd all right next up here we have strangers pray at night I think it is right pray at night the unrated version this is definitely a cool pickup I actually needed this for the collection I'm a fan of this movie. I'm a real big fan of the original Strangers. And uh, this is basically Strangers meets 8 Mile. Yes, this is a, uh, the first movie was a home invasion film, a house invasion film. This is a trailer park invasion film, guys. 2018 release directed by Johannes Roberts, who directed 47 Meters Down movies. And he also directed the new Resident Evil uh, Raccoon City movie. So that's pretty cool. He's definitely got some pedigree. And uh, yeah, man, I like this film, man. I think it's a, it's a lot of fun. They basically go vacationing. A family road trip takes a dangerous turn when they arrive at a secluded mobile home park to stay with relatives and find mysteriously, that they find mysteriously deserted. Under the cover of darkness, three mass psychopaths pay them a visit to test the family's every limit as they struggle to survive. Yeah, man. Good flick. I like it. Very good sequel. Check it out. All right, next up here we have They Reach. It's kind of like a Goonies, Strangers thing type of movie. I watched a lot of reviews on this, and it's got it's getting a lot of hate. Uh, it's a 2020 horror release. I might have effed up on. I might have shit the bed on this one. Like uh, I might have pulled a Amber Heard on this on picking this one up. But anyway, yeah, 2020 horror release directed by Silas Dahl. Um, it's got a kind of a cool story behind it. It's supposed to be in 1979. These kids find a, a possessed reel to reel. And, uh, you know, all kinds of craziness uh, ensues from that. By the way, this is free on Tubi right now. If I knew that, I would just watch it on Tubi first. It's got, you know, from what I hear, it's got a lot of good blood and gore. This is why I picked it up right here. It looks fucking cool. I'm not hearing that's a terrible movie. I'm just hearing that's it's a little disappointing. And the ending's supposed to be, like, really bad. I'll watch it, though. 13-year-old Jessica Daniels accidentally unleashes a demon from a reel-to-reel -reel player. It's, it's a cool story, I think. Which also happens to be a doorway to the dark side. 
she musters her science fair winning brain power and recruits her two best friends to battle the beast and send it back to hell before more souls are taken to the small town of Clarkston. Yeah, the uh, beast in this, or the uh, the demon, or whatever the hell it's called, is supposed to look pretty cool as well. So I'll check it out. I'll let you guys know in the next video. All right, this is a movie that I started watching last night. I'm a big fan of John Cusick. Um, why do I feel like I'm saying his name wrong? John Cusack. But anyway, yeah, John Cusack used to be big, like, but around the age of 20, he was in all kinds of movies, and then it seems like everybody forgot about him, and then, uh, you know, he was in movies like 1408 with Samuel L. Jackson, which was like a, I think that was like a Stephen King book adaptation movie, um, but he's been in a lot of stuff, man, underrated actor in his, you know, older age, in his 40s or, or, or and 50s, but um, this is an Edgar Allan Poe tale started watching this last night seems pretty interesting it's got it's got a decent reviews on imdb so uh we'll talk about this in the next video yeah man Ed, edgar Allan poe john kuzak film the raven the only one who can stop a serial killer is a man who inspired him all right next up here Found this yesterday, a steel book, Roger Corman collection, six creature features. Couldn't pass that up. Really cool. And this has got, I'm not really big into movies that are this old though. But I'm going to have to check them out. You got the Wasp Woman, Attack of the Giant Leeches, The Little Shop of Horrors. I think that was the original black and white a lot of these movies are black and white beast from haunted cave uh she gods of shark reef you know what i think i picked up the uh plastic dvd case of this so i can give that away now that i have a steel case all right last of the dollar tree movies here this is a 2015 release i'm a huge first person shooter fan and uh yeah, if you want to play Call of Duty, Vanguard, I shred in that game, guys. You do not want to see me in that game. Uh, but, yeah, I love SPS shooters. And uh, this, that's what this is, man. This is a first-person action-adventure game. Something about this guy wakes up, doesn't remember who he is, and his wife or daughter is kidnapped or something, and all of a sudden he's got, I guess he's got like a, it's filmed like with a uh, go cam and uh you know it's all first person and people are shooting at him he's and he goes through this adventure uh it was uh, a unique film when it came out and i never saw it back then so uh i think i started watching it one night but for some reason turned it off so i'll check that out and let you guys know how good that is blu-ray buck 25 hardcore henry it's got the digital HD in there. Let me give that away right now. Feeling in a given mood, giving mood, so I'm going to give that away to you guys. Every time I give the digital copy, people people always take it, so I always see the comment in there. I cannot open this for anything. There we go. Now I got something. There it is. Have a way with it. Hardcore Henry. The P double M's gift to you. All right, let's talk about this now. I wrote some notes on this guy, so bear with me here. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk too much about Donnie Darko. It's an absolute classic. I love the film. It's too long, but it's it's paced so good that it doesn't even bother me bother me that it's two two hours and like like 13 minutes or some shit like that. 
Let's talk about the people who are in this because the acting is just tremendous in this movie. Catherine Ross plays the psychiatrist in the movie. And I do not know why. I kept thinking it was uh, Meredith Baxter Burney for some reason. The whole the whole entire movie, I was thinking, that has got to be Meredith Baxter Burney, who was the uh, mother from Family Ties. Uh, but, it, but it's not. Uh, Patrick Swayze's in this movie. He's a charlatan, uh, motivational speaker. He's, he's great in it. And uh, rest in peace to him. Uh, Mary McDonald plays the mother. She's always drinking like a glass of wine. She plays that perfect, you know, sort of drunk, wine drinking, 40 to 50 year old mom in the movie. And um, let me see. Holmes Osborne plays the father. He's good. Drew Barrymore plays a teacher in it. Maggie Gyllenhaal. I always forget, forget when I see her in movies that she's... Actually, she's Jake Gyllenhaal's real sister, and it's cool that they play brother and sister in this movie. And uh, Jana Malone, or, or no, I'm sorry, Jenna Malone, who's, who's his girlfriend in the movie, she was actually in The Ruins. We talked about that in a recent uh, movie. And a movie that I recommend to you guys that I saw at Dollar Tree in a old drop, The Neon Demon. Very visually stunning movie. The fucking soundtrack in this movie is so fucking great. Tears for Fears, Head Over Heels, Tears for Fears, A Mad World, or Mad World. There's a Mad World cover. I think all the all the music in the, in, the, in the movie are covers, but they're really good covers. And that Mad World cover is probably better than the original uh, song, in my opinion. Uh, make sure you watch the director's cut. Never Tear Us Apart by NXS is in this. Uh, Duran Duran's Notorious. It's just got the banging ass, banging ass soundtrack uh, uh, from the 1990s. It brings you right back to the 1990s. And yeah, man, I love the movie Donnie Darko. Listen, time travel movies confuse the shit out of me. I don't know what it is about them, but I, they always confuse me. I am still not sure I completely 100% understand this movie. I understand it a little better now. I've watched some explanation videos, and there's a tangent universe, and there's a non-tangent universe. So the dreamlike state sequences, the time travel, all of that shit is in the tangent universe. And this is all written in this fictional book by the author that's in the movie. She writes a book, something uh, something in the lines of uh, a book of, of time travel or whatever. And I think this is a real book that you can purchase and stuff, or a real fictional book that you can purchase, if that makes any sense. I think it has pages missing or something like that. But it basically is the blueprint to understanding the film, if that makes any sense. Make sure you watch the director's cut, because a lot of the scenes where they show pages from the book is is cut out but uh absolute classic film all right guys i'd be remiss if i did not mention this one of my favorite parts of this movie is all the pop culture references in it and my favorite pop reference in this movie is when donnie darko breaks down the smurfs for us and tells us that the smurfs are asexual and that's the reason why they're not attracted to smurfette my mind was blown. Thank you. And then the not so classic, not so loved sequel to the movie is S. Darko. Just a side note, the, uh, the director of the first film, Richard Kelly, has been quoted saying that he refuses to watch this movie. That's a real dick move in my opinion. The guy must be a fucking asshole. No which stands for Samantha Darko, which I did not realize at first, and it's perfect. It perfectly makes sense when I explain to you what I'm gonna to explain to you. So, don't do what I did, by the way. Never watch, even if you watched it three years ago, refresh yourself with Donnie Darko and watch them as a double header. Watch them back to back, or watch one one day, watch S. Darko the next day. Do not do what I did do because it, it confuses the fuck out of you. Especially if you don't understand the tangent universe and the non-tangent universe, you will get 
even more confused in this movie than you did in the uh, the original. So I'm watching this film, and you know, I was gonna come and just rip it a uh, new asshole, talk shit about it, dog the shit out of it, and tell you guys not to watch it. And then I decided to go back and watch the original Donnie Darko. And as soon as I watched Donnie Darko, I started feeling like I would like this movie better. So I watched the second viewing of this movie. This is the second time in like two weeks. And I liked it a lot better, guys. So just remember that. Now, the funny thing is, I'm watching, as I get to my point here, I'm watching Donnie Darko. And there's a scene where Donnie Darko's younger daughter, she can't be but like 10, 11 years old, she's on this, this cute dance team, and it's this cool little sequence. I think they're playing Notorious, and she's dancing with her dance team. I think they're called Sparkle Motion or something like that. And I'm looking at her in the eyes, and I'm like, this girl looks so much like the actress that plays an older her in S. Darko. Like the director did an amazing job of casting, or the, whoever, whoever does the casting casted the perfect girl. And then I start reading Wikipedia afterwards and realize the girl in this movie is the girl from the original movie. And by the way, she is horror royalty. She's the girl from the ring uh, she plays Samara Morgan, the creepy girl with the black hair in front of her face, in the fucking ring. That's who DeVay Chase is, the actress that plays uh, the sister in both movies. So I couldn't believe it. That mind fucking blown. So now I'm really like, that like elevates the movie to even a higher plateau for me. Uh, now that we have horror royalty. So... That helped helped me out a lot. Um, Devane Chase is not the greatest act, actress. I, mean, I, I will say that. And there's a lot of like pop bubblegum like conversation that's you you like they say they ran away in the movie. So I'm assuming they're at least no older than 17 years old, probably around 16, 17 years old. And some of the dialogue is just it's kind of a turn off. It's like I don't think girls that age would even be talking like that, talking about god taking marshmallow farts and stuff and i don't know just stupid stuff i hate some of the dialogue in the movie that's the downfall of this movie some of the dialogue is really poor but um it's not a bad film and listen for everyone that wants to hate on it man if you're a donnie darko fan we have nothing else this is all we have is a sequel and uh yeah man i'll uh, let me read the uh, synopsis here to it Strange events plague a young woman and her best friend, who, by the way, the best friend is played by Brianna Evigan. I thought she did a good acting uh, performance in there. Definitely she acts better than um, DeVay Chase. When their cars break down on a cross-country road trip. So not really a uh, very great explanation, but, um, you know, this is the same thing. It's got time travel in it again, black holes, and this whole tangent universe the demonic rabbit is not in this movie, but they do construct a metal, um, uh, the, the guy who is the, um, I guess you'd say he's the receiver in the movie, the guy who comes back from the military and ends up dying from this meteor that crashes, which you, I mean, spoiler alert, alert here, guys, because you find that out at the end of the movie, but uh, he constructs a, a metal rabbit demon mask and shit that's pretty badass. But, um, yeah, man, this is not as bad as people say, man. Uh, definitely a, uh, something to look out for. And uh, a cool addition, man. A lot, there's lots of bonus features. I'm not going to go over all the bonus features. This video has ran way too long, guys. Did I give this away? I think I gave this digital copy away already. If not, you can check it out. But I think I might have gave it away. I'm not sure, though. AC's trying to blow it away. It's got the Blu-ray, the DVD, the bonus disc. Why am I missing? Oh, there you go. Everything's there.
S Darko, guys. Check it out. All right. Hopefully I did that some justice, but you need to check it out. If you are a fan of Donnie Darko, this is a must-see. All right, last movie, and I'll let you guys go. Thank you to my subscribers down in the comments for telling me, you know, telling me that Dread is actually something that I need to see because you guys were right, man. I had a lot of fun watching this movie. Let me read the synopsis. In the America... In the America of the post-apocalyptic future, Dredd and his new partner, Anderson, are judges, the only force, wait, are judges, the only force battling for justice when ruthless crime boss, Lena Hetty, tries to peddle a dangerous reality-altering drug the two judges declare war in this unrelenting thrill ride. Sorry about that. I was having trouble reading that. But it's funny, like, the drug in this movie, especially, you know, I'm from Houston, guys. So the whole codeine, drip, the whole lean thing, the whole screw music thing is, is originated from Houston, Texas. So this is kind of like a synthetic lean, uh, this drug that was created in this movie, like a pill form of lean. And... Uh, so that's hilarious. But, um, yeah, man, this is a fun movie, man. And um, it's like a comic book style movie. It's very colorful. And uh, Dredd is this, the guy who plays Dredd has this, like, uh, I don't think you see his eye, his face the whole movie. He's, he's got that Dredd mask on, so you just see his mouth and him making this mean look on his face. And he talks in this, like, deep voice and shit. And uh, he's got some really good one-liners in the movie. The actress that plays, let me see what her name is, that plays Anderson, who is a rookie female cop that he has to take under his wing. And she's played by Olivia Thurby. She's so beautiful. And um, so they're judges, and they have to go into this giant, I don't know, it's like a apartment complex uh, ran by this drug lord and they get trapped inside of it. So it's kind of like the movie The Raid or uh, New Jack City to a certain extent. And uh, they have to fight their way out of it. And they got all these badass, cool little weapons. He, he's kind of like Batman. He's got all these uh, different weapons on his belt and stuff. And they got some badass guns in this movie. And, um, but yeah, the captain tells them, it's cool in the beginning of the movie, the captain says, you need to take this girl under your wing and you need to evaluate her. And uh, you're going to judge her or rate her on whether she's going to continue to be a police officer or a judge. And uh, the captain says, go ahead and throw her in the deep water. And the guy says, it's all the deep water. I just love these little one-liners in the movie. And then in the beginning, like when they're uh, getting into some hairy-ass shit, he looks at her and, he, and before they run into a room full of uh, villains and shit, He's like, are you ready? And, uh, or he says, are you ready? And, um, she, she's, she looks nervous as fuck. And, he, and he's like, you don't look ready. And later on in the movie, as she starts to get her footing and she starts to become a badass, just like him, maybe even more so she becomes like the hero in the movie. Uh, they have a similar scene where he says, are you ready? And he looks at her and he's like, you look ready. And uh, it's just like a really cool scene between them two. And uh, yeah, man, I really enjoyed this, man. Thought it was a fun film. And uh, yeah, check it out, Dread. All right, guys. And by the way, I'm not going to talk about Drive Angry because I've talked about that before. I think I talked about that in the last video. This is a really cool uh, double header here. Check it out. All right, guys, that's it. As long-winded as that was, I don't know how long. It's probably This video is probably over an hour long. I'm the PWM. Good out. Good luck out there, guys, finding whatever physical media that you're looking for. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.